Welcome everyone to our first free webinar series organized by ABS on Responsible Pet Ownership. I'm Nicole Chia, today's host, and with me in this webinar will be our ABS pet expert, Dr. Alvin Khan, who will be sharing with us about what you need to know about getting a pet this festive season. So whether you're thinking of getting a pet, are already a pet owner, or just want to learn more, Dr. Alvin will share tips on how to decide which pet to get, if you should adopt a pet from a pet shelter or get one from a pet shop and how to be a responsible pet owner. That's not all. If you love animals but are unable to get one at the moment, Dr. Alvin will also share with you other alternatives that you can consider. So at the end of this webinar, we may not be able to answer all the questions, but you can always have a, drop in your questions in the Q&A session below. So, I'll pass on the time now to Dr. Alvin Khan. Thank you. Hi everyone, I am Dr. Alvin Khan and I'm a veterinarian in the Animal and Veterinary Service, a cluster of the National Park Sport Singapore. So today, I'm going to share with you what you need to know before getting a pet this festive season. So it's the holiday season and many of us are in the mood for giving. And also because of the COVID situation, a lot of us are now working from home and we are spending a lot more time at home. So with this, I know many of us are starting to think about getting a pet to keep us company at home. So if you are planning to get a pet or if you are planning to buy a pet for someone, today's webinar will give you a lot more information on what you need to know before you get a pet to make sure that the pet that you get can be healthy and happy. So first of all, in Singapore, we have a list of animals that are suitable to be kept as pets. So commonly, um, the different animals that are being kept as pets include dogs and cats, um, various fish and birds, and also small mammals such as rabbits, guinea pigs, uh, chinchillas and hamsters. And then of course, we have the terrapins as well. So the reason why we have a list of animals that are suitable to be kept as pets is firstly for the well-being and the welfare of the animal. So before an animal can be kept as a pet, we need to consider whether or not they are suitable to be kept in captivity and whether under our care we can provide all the necessary resources for the animal to exhibit their natural behaviour. Uh, second point is for public safety. So there are some animals that are venomous and these are clearly not suitable to be kept as pets. And thirdly, we also need to think about our environment and our biodiversity in Singapore. So if ever any of these pet animals are accidentally released or they escape into our environment, we need to ensure that they do not present a severe threat to the local biodiversity and the local fauna in our nature. So this list of pets is actually quite a big variety and it should be able to meet the needs of the various pet owners in Singapore. So just what does it take to be a responsible pet owner? So I myself, I have a 16-year-old Jack Russell named Oreo, and I've been taking care of him for many years. So I would have gone through this whole experience and this whole process of deciding whether or not I'm ready to have a pet. And after having a pet, the amount of resources and effort needed to take care of our pets. So uh, pet ownership can be a very satisfying experience for you and your family, but you need to know that together with owning a pet, there comes a lot of responsibility and commitment on your part as well. So you must be prepared to invest your time, your money and lots of effort to make sure that the pet that you have is well taken care of and the pet is happy and healthy with you. So first of all, uh, to think about whether or not you're ready to have a pet, it's not just whether you are ready, but you need to think about whether your family is agreeable to have the pet as well. The uh, main reason is the pet is going to share the whole environment at home, and you need to think about various things like, for example, if you're going to get a dog, a dog is unable to talk like us, so they communicate by barking. So if you're okay with barking, are the rest of the members at home okay with the noise from the barking as well? Next is smell. So you can try to keep your pet as clean as possible. You can clean your home as much as you want. But uh, pets, they will pee and poo in the environment and they will also lick themselves to groom themselves. So no matter how much you try, there will always be at least a little bit of smell coming from animals. 
And that is something that you need to be aware of. That is something you need to be able to accept. And of course, uh, some pets, they may cause allergies to certain members of your household. So you need to consider this. If there's anyone at home that's allergic to a certain species, and if you want a pet, you might want to consider other species that are more hypoallergenic, less likely to shed fur, or completely total different um, pet breed as well. Next is, uh, so if you do not make sure that your family's members are agreeable to have a pet, sometimes uh, it can cause conflict and then it can cause a bit of uh, unhappiness at home as well. And next is whether or not you know what is required to take care of your pet properly. So first of all is the housing environment. So many of us, when we buy young pets such as puppies and kittens, they are quite small, they occupy a very small space, but then as they grow, they will grow bigger and you'll need more space. So for example, if you get a large breed dog, um, something, a puppy that starts from a small as 30 centimeter can go up to be at least a meter long. So they'll need a lot more space for their resting area. They'll need a lot more space to be able to walk around. So can you provide that space for your pet? And also if you buy prey species, uh, such as uh, rabbits, guinea pigs, or even hamsters, uh, they will need some hiding space so they can hide from anything that's causing them stress. So other than giving them the space to live and where you can see them, there's only additional space where you can hide, where you cannot see them. So all these space considerations you need to take into consideration when you want to get a pet. Next is on temperature. So in Singapore, we have tropical climate. Our temperature is almost 30 degrees every day. But there are certain uh, species of animals, such as Arctic breeds. If you think about the Siberian Huskies, or Alaska Malamutes, they won't cope very well in our tropical climate. So if you're thinking of getting such breeds, you need to make sure you have a cool area for them to rest at home, or you may even need to go as far as to invest in a permanent air-conditioned room for them so that they are comfortable. Um, next is on diet. So you need to make sure that you give your pet a nutritionally balanced diet. So that one of the easiest way is to get a commercial diet that is balanced from a pet shop or from the supermarkets. So a balanced diet means if you keep feeding this diet to your animal for breakfast, lunch and dinner and they enjoy it, it's going to be okay because your pet will get all the nutrients they need from this diet. However, if you are going to consider preparing a home-cooked diet or even a raw food diet, that's where things become a bit more tricky because such things are uh, made by us. So we need to make sure that all the nutrients are balanced. If not, the, the pet can be susceptible to diseases. For example, in cats, they will need a certain amino acid called taurine. And if the diet doesn't contain enough taurine, if you keep giving it to them for a long period of time, they can be susceptible to heart disease. Okay, next is on exercise. So um, depending on your lifestyle and the breed of pet you have, you need to make sure that you are compatible. So if you are a very sporty person, you want to take your dog running with you, uh, having a flat face breed of dog will not be suitable. You probably need to get a working breed such as Jack Russell or even a Collie. And you know that many flat face breeds are quite popular now. Uh, Many people think they're cute, such as uh, Pugs or Frenchies or French Bulldogs. But do be aware that because of their flat face, they usually have difficulty breathing. So they cannot exercise as much and they can also take part in strenuous activities. So you need to take note of all these considerations for the different kind of breeds of pets that you want to get. And lastly, in terms of grooming, if you have a pet with long fur, then you will need to commit to regular grooming to make sure that their skin and coat is in good condition and prevents any method fur that can cause skin problems. So all this will cost money and it take the time as well. So keeping a pet is going to cost money and it can be quite expensive as well. So um, usually when you look at a pet in a pet shop, you will look at the price uh, for puppy or kitten, you might think, okay, you, you set aside, you save up a few thousand dollars. If you're buying a rabbit or chinchilla, a few hundred dollars. If you're buying a terrapin, maybe as low as five, ten dollars. But this cost of buying a pet is not the only money you need to spend in the lifetime of your pet. So throughout its lifetime, you need to be aware that you need to buy food. You will need to um, send your pet for grooming. You might even need to send them for behavior training. Uh, and if they're sick, you need to bring them to the vet. And even if they are not sick, we recommend you to take your pet to the vet regularly at least once a year. 
this will allow them to get their vaccine boosters and also do a thorough health check because animals cannot talk, they cannot tell you that they're not feeling well. So it's very important to let your vet have a thorough health check. So if your pet has any health condition, they can be identified early, they can start treatment early and that leads to a higher chance of success for treatment. Next is, how long can your pet live? So other than thinking of the immediate readiness to protect, uh, different species can live for a different amount of years. So for example, dogs and cats, they on average live up to 18 years old, or if you have a hamster, it's a bit shorter, up to two and three years old. So when you want to get a pet, you must think about your future as well. So for example, if, you're, if you know they're going to be posted overseas, for work or studies and you will not be able to commit to caring for your pet throughout its entire time, then this is where you may want to uh, make a different decision or get a pet with a shorter lifespan. So uh, if you cannot remember everything that we just shared with you today, don't worry. If you want to get a pet, you need some help to make the decision. We have a checklist for you to use on our ABS website. So just go to our AVS website and search for the checklist. And so I know that many of us, or many of the pet owners who buy their pets on impulse, they may actually regret their decision later on. And that's where they start to face problems. So they face a dilemma. The, the, pet con the amount of care that pet needs conflict with their lifestyle. They cannot wake up early every day. They cannot exercise the pet every day. So they have a dilemma. What should they do? Should they continue caring for their pet, change their lifestyle? or sometimes, unfortunately, the pet may even be abandoned. So it's okay, at this point in time, if you feel that you're not ready, you can always re-evaluate again later on when you're more ready. Yes, indeed, Dr. Alwin, getting a pet is a lifetime commitment and should not be taken out of, or get out of impulse. So let me introduce you to Little T. So little T is estimated to be about 10 years old. She's a red-eared slider. Sometimes at pet shops, you can see these tiny little turtles this size. And they do grow up to this size. Look, it's even bigger than my face. So red-eared sliders can live up to 20 years. So they have a very long lifespan. As what Dr. Elwin mentioned just now, it is very important to know what type of pet suits you. So as red-eared sliders grow up, they need a much bigger space. So it is not wise to abandon them in parks, and it is an offense under a Wildlife Act to do so. Releasing animals that have been bred and in ca kept in captivity harms them and our ecosystem. They will not be able to take care of themselves and even fend for themselves in new, unfamiliar surroundings. So the few that are able to adapt to the environment will have to compete with other native species for resources. So it is very important to actually look for a home for them if you are pet owners are not able to take care of them at that point of time. Or they can also reach out to animal welfare groups to, for help to rehome their pets. So in the next segment, Dr. Elwin will provide you with a rundown of making the correct decisions in getting a pet. So Dr. Elwin? Thanks, Nicole. So you can see that little T, she's a huge terrapin now at 10 years old, but when she was bought from the shop 10 years ago, she was no bigger than a 50 cent coin and probably no more expensive than only $5. So it can be quite misleading based on the initial size and the cost of a pet and the amount of commitment and the duration of commitment you need to give your pet after that for its lifetime. So this brings me to the next part of our webinar. So after thinking through of whether you're ready for a pet and you think you're ready, where can you get a pet from and what should you look out for when getting a pet to make sure that your pet is happy and healthy? So the first thing you can do, which is a really nice thing, is to adopt a pet. So you can give a homeless animal a second chance. And there are 14 animal welfare group partners who partner the Animal and Veterinary Service for initiatives on animal welfare and animal management. So these animal welfare groups, they have a variety of pets uh, for adoption. And one of the benefits of adopting a pet is that they are usually mature animals. So their personality, their appearance, their size, their behavior is unlikely to change. So this is really what you see, is what you get, and unlikely to have any surprises later on. 
And also, the welfare groups will help to screen the behaviour of the pets, whether they are suitable for adoption. And they will also help to match adopters to the pets. So this will increase the success of adoption. There will usually be a small adoption fee involved, and this is to cover costs such as sterilisation of the pet, or even preventive health care such as vaccines and parasite treatments, as well as a bit of administrative cost. So uh, you may approach any of the animal welfare groups to find out more about their adoption procedures and the list of welfare groups can be found on the ABS website. And Cole, what do you think about adopting pets? I think adopting pets from a pet shelter is a very meaningful experience because each pet you see at the shelter has its each unique characteristic and personality and it is only true with interaction with them and also experiencing certain things like walking with them and also feeding them. That's when you see the joy of adopting a pet from a pet shelter. Yeah. Thanks Nico. Fully agree with that. And so if uh, you decide instead that you want to buy a pet, you can buy a pet from a licensed pet shop in Singapore. And these businesses, they are licensed by the Animal and Veterinary Service to make sure that they meet the standards for animal health and welfare. So uh, do take note that when you are buying pets from pet shops, they are usually juvenile animals. So they look very cute, they are quite small. But animals will grow, and as they grow, they will grow bigger, their appearance will change, their behaviour may change as well. So all this you need to take into consideration. And so let's say you want to buy a pet and you walk into a pet shop. What is the first thing you need to look out for to make sure that you are in a proper place? So when ABS licensed pet shops, we require them to display their license as well as their grading. So we grade them from A to D. The higher the grade, the higher their standard of animal care. So this is one thing you should look out for the moment you enter the pet shop. Look out for the license, look for their grade on display. And next is just like how we decide which restaurant you want to go for dinner. It's a very good idea to check on reviews for this pet shop. So look at what other customers are saying about this pet shop. Did they have a good experience? Uh, was were the pets that they got from this pet shop okay from their past experience? And it's also a good idea to get this from various sources. So for example, you can Google for them. You can also check online forums for various uh, reviews of the pet shops. So now if you think that you are at a super pet shop that's licensed, that has good reviews and you walk in, you see the animals on display and you see a particular animal you like and you want to know whether the animal is healthy, what should you look out for next? So I recommend you don't just look at the animal that you're interested in, look at all the animals around as well because the health of all the animals can uh, actually um, either affect the health of the individual animal. Some diseases can spread, some are infectious. So um, young animals, they usually sleep a lot, but when they are awake, they are very energetic and they are also very curious. So if animals are awake, we expect to see them uh, smelling the environment, licking objects, playing with each other. So if they are not active, when they are awake, they look a bit dull, that is where you might want to ask some questions to the seller on whether on the health of the animals. Um, other signs of new health you should look out for when buying an animal include uh, any signs of coughing, or sneezing or even diarrhea in the animals. So if you see any of these being displayed by animals, you also want to discuss whether the seller or the health of the animals. If you are buying an imported pet, uh, one thing you can ask for is for the seller to show you the import documents. So all imported pets, they will need to have an import permit. On the import permit, there will be the microchip number. You can compare that against the microchip number implanted in the puppy or the kitten. So this way is how you make sure that the pet was indeed imported. And you can also request for the health certificate. So when pets are imported, they will need to have a health certificate to show that they were healthy at the point of export. So all this will give you more assurance that the pet that you're getting is healthy. Um, with all young animals, they do not have a very well developed immune system. So they're actually susceptible to infectious diseases. That's why we have a regulation that uh, puppies and kittens being sold, they must be vaccinated at least twice before they can be sold. So how do you check on this? Ask the, ask the seller to show you their vaccination booklets. You should be able to see that the puppy or kitten has received two vaccinations given by a veterinarian in Singapore or overseas. And if you have this record, then you can have more assurance as well. 
So uh, there are additional requirements if you are buying a dog. So all dogs in Singapore need to be licensed. And maybe I can let Nicole share with you a bit more about the importance of getting a dog licensed. Alright, so licensing is very important for the accountability of dogs and also traceability in the event of a rabies outbreak. So this year, we, uh, we implemented a one-time dog licensing for sterilized dog. Only, uh, so dog owners only need to apply with and parks once with a license fee of $35 and this license will be valid throughout the life of the dog without having to renew it every year. So yeah, it is very important for health purposes and traceability in the event of rabies outbreak. Thanks, Nico. I think the one-time licensing is very convenient, so I don't have to remember to renew my license every year. And also, uh, licensing is very important for traceability, as well as in the event if your dog gets lost or runs away from home. If your dog is licensed and has a microchip, it will be easier to trace your pet and reunite with them again. And of course, uh, with the one-time licensing fee of $35, you can actually save up to $800 in the whole lifetime of your pet. So with this money saved, you can actually uh, choose to donate this to a char charitable cause for animals, or you can even use the money saved to buy more toys and more food for your pet. And okay, so next is online sales of pets. Online sales of pets are becoming more popular now, but the same rules apply to online sellers. So they will need to be a licensed pet shop, they will need to display their license number. So if you encounter an online seller who's not able to show you their license number, I recommend that you report such cases to ABS and then you're going to look for another more reliable pet shop to get a pet from. And also be aware that usually when buying pets, uh, buyers, you may have to provide a down payment or even do some kind of pre-booking arrangement where you make some financial commitment. So this is to make sure that uh, you are in the queue to get a pet. Uh, but when this happens, do be aware that you are never pressurized in getting a pet. So if at any point in time you change your mind about getting a pet, like you're not so comfortable about this seller, or if you reassess yourself and you think you aren't ready to commit yet, don't be pressurized because of these down payments that you have to proceed to make the purchase. So it's actually better to, to stop early than to actually proceed to buy the pet and then later on if you can't commit enough resources or the time to care for the pet that will create more problems downstream. Next, uh, other than adopting a pet or buying a pet from a pet shop, you can also you might also want to consider importing a pet yourself. So if you're considering this, it's very important for you to check on the breeder of the pet overseas to make sure that they have the necessary uh, welfare and health standards for their animals. And when you are importing a pet into Singapore, you also need to comply with your import requirements. And this requirement is to prevent the introduction of infectious diseases into Singapore. Some of these diseases can affect humans, such as rabies. So rabies can spread from mammals to humans and it's a fatal disease. In Singapore, we have been very lucky to be free from rabies for more than 50 years. So if you're importing a dog and cat, what the general requirements are is that they will need to receive a rabies vaccine before export. They will also need to do a blood test to show that they have the necessary antibodies against the disease. And depending on which country they come from, they may also need to undergo 10 to 30 days of quarantine after arriving in Singapore. So other than all these uh, pre-export requirements, um, it's also important to be aware now because of the COVID situation, there's actually a lot of uh, disruptions to air travel. So this might make it a bit more challenging to import a pet. For example, if there's going to be any delays in the import of your pet, you need to check that all the vaccination, the blood tests, they are still valid because if they have expired, then you need to redo them again before importing your pet. Uh, sometimes the journey to Singapore can also have unexpected delays, for example, prolonged stopovers. So you need to make sure that your pet has enough water, enough food, and ensure that the crate is big enough to be comfortable. Because for the entire journey from export to import, your pet will be held within a crate. So you want to make sure that the crate is spacious and uh, safe for your pet to live in. So what you can do is to make arrangements with the seller or the exporter, make sure that they have all these backup plans in place in case there's any uh, unexpected delays to the travel, that your pet remains safe and can arrive safely in Singapore. 
And of course, if the pet does arrive in Singapore and they're unable to meet some requirements, then there may be certain measures that you need to follow, for example, extended quarantine for the pet. So take all this into consideration. If you are thinking of importing a pet, uh, it's an option, but there will be a lot more requirements to fulfill as well. So in summary, when buying a pet, you will be committing a lot of time, effort, and it's only right that you make this your best decision. So at any point in time, you're not comfortable with anything, do not feel pressurized into making the purchase. It's always good to give yourself some pulling off time. Just uh, give yourself some time to think about it. And we still recommend that you talk to someone who's knowledgeable about animals. You can talk to a veterinarian for this, for example. Huh, that's really insightful, Dr. Alvin. So ABS has 14 animal welfare group partners where you can adopt your friends, uh, pets from. They are Animal Lovers League, Action for Singapore Dogs, Cat Welfare Society, Causes for Animals, Exclusively Mongrels, Hamster Society Singapore, House Rabbit Society Singapore, Mercy Light, Animal Rescue Sanctuary, Noah's Art Cares, Oasis Second Chance Animal Shelter, Purely Adoption, SPCA, SOSD, and Voices for Animals. Each animal welfare groups have their own criteria for adoption, and if you are interested in adopting one, do drop them an email. Hmm. So Dr. Alvin, if we are not ready to own a pet, but want to know more about them and experience them before getting one, what do we have to do? Okay, Nicole. So some of us we may be thinking of getting a pet, but we're still undecided. We may want to we like we enjoy interacting with animals, but we're not ready to own one yet, or we want to test ourselves to see whether we're actually ready to own a pet. So there are various things you can do in Singapore before uh, making that decision. So first of all, you can volunteer at one of our animal welfare groups in Singapore. So we have many animal shelters and they have many different kinds of animals under their care. So you can volunteer your time there to help to take care of the animals. So some of the activities you can do when volunteering include feeding the animals, uh, cleaning them, grooming them. You can also take the dogs out for walks. And sometimes you can even be involved in their adoption drive to help to adopt the animals out. Mm. Other things you can do include uh, visiting a pet cafe. So we do have uh, several pet cafes in Singapore. So these are places where you can pay a small fee and then you can go to the cafe and you have a few hours to interact with the resident dogs or cats in the cafe. And third option is if you have a friend with a pet or you know a friend who has a pet, you can offer to take care of the pet for them. Uh, you can offer to help them to walk their dogs so that they can take a break. And if you know that they're going to be away for a period of time, you can also offer to help them to pet seek their animals. Thank you for your sharing today, Dr. Alvin. So do drop in your questions in the comment box below. And we will be ready to answer them. Hey, hey we have so many questions coming in to us. All right. Okay, so we have many questions here. So let's yeah. take some questions. Oh, all of them are really interesting. Okay, there's this one. Okay, so we have a question from a viewer, Wee Fong. So we is asking whether it is advisable to feed his pet cat leftover home cooked food or it is generally recommended to feed them with pet food. What are some of the things to look out for in pet food? Okay, that's a very good question, Reform. So in general, if you are already feeding your pet a commercial diet, that would already be balanced. So meaning all the nutrients your cat needs can be from that food. Also, if your cat enjoys eating that food, then there's really no there's really no harm giving that food for breakfast, lunch, dinner, seven days a week. Of course, uh, sometimes you might want to give your pet treats. You might even want to give them leftover as treats. So there are a few things you need to consider when you are giving your um, cat new kinds of food. So first of all, whenever you introduce new food, there's always a chance that they might be intolerant to the new food. They might have uh, a bit of diarrhea. And so if that happens, you will want to stop giving that food. 
also there are certain foods that are toxic to animals and these are things you want to avoid. For example, uh, uh, grapes are toxic to dogs, chocolates are toxic as well. So these are items that you want to avoid giving to pets. And of course, if you are going to supplement your, the diet of your pet, do note that the calorie intake will also increase overall. So if you are doing this over a prolonged period of time, sometimes you might notice that your pet might be getting a bit bigger. So if you're going to give treats, do remember that the overall calorie intake is changing. Uh, monitor the, the body condition, monitor the weight of your pet, and make sure that you're not overfeeding your pet. Okay, let's answer another question right now. So with me here, if you could have, if you heard any meowing, this is Samson, our pet cat. So she wants some screen time right now. Okay. okay, let's answer another question. Which question should we answer next? Hi, Samson. Okay, next question. We have a question from Jessica Ong. So Jessica shares that she struggles to cut her dog's nails. It is difficult to keep him still, but you also heard that sometimes dog nails get naturally fouled when they are walking and running. Is that true? So thanks, Jessica, for your questions. So uh, I myself, I do struggle cutting the nail of my dog sometimes. So it's very important when uh, doing all these um, new procedures. It's most important thing is to start young. So if you have a puppy or even if you have a kitten, is to start young and train them and get them used to all these procedures, whether it's cutting nails, whether it's brushing teeth. So how you introduce them to these new procedures is to always start gradually and keep the experience positive. So by gradually, I mean you may not want to show the nail clipper to your pet immediately if they're not used to it. So uh, what you can do is to first start off, get your pet familiar with you touching their paws. And then if they're okay with that, you give them a treat to keep it positive and so they enjoy the experience. After they're okay with you touching their paws, you might want to go further to start to touch their nails to show their nails, to push their nails out. And if they're okay with that, you prolong the whole experience. So instead of touching for a few seconds, you touch for a minute. And then when they're okay with that, you progress on to introduce the nail clipper. So you can bring the nail clipper, you can hold the nail clipper against their body, get them used to this equipment, to the sight of the equipment, to the sound of it. And then building on this, gradually you start to gradually bring the nail clipper to the nail and see whether you can get a nail cut. If any time they are struggling or the animal is not happy, do not force them because you don't want this to become a negative experience for them. Then it become more difficult. On whether or not you need to cut your dog nails regularly or whether they can be fouled naturally, the best way is to monitor and observe the nails of your dogs. So um, generally, when dog nails roll long, they might start to curl. And when they curl, they will start to poke into the flesh of the paw pads. So keep this in mind. Monitor the nail growth. If it's growing too long and it's not being fouled naturally, then that's where you need to come in to cut the nails. If you're lucky and your dog nails are always naturally short, then uh, you may not need to cut the nails that often then. Okay. Okay, we still have time for a few more questions. So... Dr. Alwin, while well, questions are coming in, can I also ask a personal question when it comes to walking my dog? If ever I have to get one or want to get one from a pet shelter, how often do you think dogs should be walked? Okay, so um, walking a dog is a very important activity actually because it not only gives your pet exercise, mm -hmm. so it helps them expand their energy, they are less likely to have behavior problems, it's also a very enriching experience for them. So when your dog goes out, they will see different sights, they will smell different scents, so it's a lot of mental stimulation, it's very good for them. And as well, this is very good for pet owner bonding. When you take a dog out for a walk, you spend time with them, you get to know them better, they get to know you better as well. So I uh, recommend daily walks, it also depends on the breed of the dog you have. So if you have a very sporty breed or a working breed, you'll likely need to be exercised multiple times a day, maybe okay. two times or even three times. So it's dependent on the breed as well as the size? Yes, that's Okay, right. that's good. And then if, of, of course, you have one of those uh, uh, cute breeds, the Brachys of Alex now, the French Bulldogs or the Pugs, mm -hmm. who have a bit of difficulty breathing, yes. that's where you can take them out for walks, okay. but you don't want to walk them too far and not too strenuous as well. Okay, okay thank you for sharing. So shall we take some questions okay. now? Thank you for that question. How about 
that one over there. So, uh, okay. So, okay. so we have a question from Siok Ming. So Siok Ming is asking if I want to adopt a dog. But will an adopted dog be harder to befriend, or less loyal, or harder to train? Actually, that's a very interesting question. I do want to know as well, if, because I'm thinking of adopting a Singapore Special, so I wonder whether it, they're harder to befriend or not as well. Okay. So with adoption of dogs, uh, different animals will have different personality, different behaviours, and also different past experience that can affect how they behave. So one thing good about adoption is you get to interact with the animal as part of decision making whether the animal is suitable for you. So you can sit in the enclosure with them, you can take them out for a walk to see whether you are okay to handle the animal, whether the animal is okay with you. So if uh, you're compatible, that's good. And like we shared previously, all these are mature animals the behaviour, the appearance are likely to change. So okay. if they're compatible with you, they're likely to be okay with you. But however, unfortunately, if you find a pet that is not compatible, then uh, it's not too bad. You can always look at other animals in the shelter as there are many other animals that need a home as well. Alright, thank you for that question, Ming Tan. So now we're going to move on to the next question that we have. There's really a lot of questions. Okay. So there are so many questions. I also okay. have... So Denise Chen. So Denise Chen asked, if my house has a garden, can I walk my dog less frequently? So Dr. Alvin, what do you think about that one? Okay, so first of all, Denise, you're very lucky to have a garden for your dog. Okay. So with a garden, actually, uh, this means your dog can actually uh, go out and pee and poo on its own. Uh, during its own time, but uh, the amount of exercise that a dog can get in a garden and the amount of exercise they get during a proper walk is a bit different. So um, if it's just in a garden, your dog may just be going out to pee and then they go back in again. So that's very different from actually if you spend dedicate 15 minutes or even 30 minutes to walking your dog outside. And of course, there are benefits to walking your dog. Uh, like for example, the time you spend with your dog is good for bonding for you to, the, to, to your dog and from your dog to you as well. And whenever you take your dog out for a walk, it's a very good time for you to even observe how your dog's health. So are they able to walk properly? You can, ex you can observe whether or not they are still able to exercise to the same level or whether they are having any difficulties walking or having difficulties keeping up. And that can actually be signs where you might need to uh, bring your pet to the vet for a further health check. So uh, it's good if you have a garden, it'll be good for your dog, but uh, that shouldn't be completely replaced. Uh, the amount of time you spend exercising your pet. Thank you, Denise, for your question. And thank you, Dr. Alwin, for answering the question. Let's take in a few more questions that are on responsible pet ownership. Uh, how about Ang Cheng Wan's one? That one looks interesting. That one over there? This one. Yes. Okay. That one. Okay, okay so, so Ang Chui Wan asks, must I socialize with my dog with other dogs? Is the dog run the best way to socialize my dog with others? So what do you think about that, Dr. Alvin? Okay, that's a good question from Chi Wan. So with socialization of dogs, the best time to start is when they are young because that's when they are learning and that's where they can be can be taught the most things. So always start socialization when they are young and there are different ways you can socialize your dogs. So it's important to socialize them with other dogs. So you can encounter other dogs in a dog run. Uh, you can also encounter other dogs in your neighborhood. But uh, when you're going to interact with other dogs, to make sure that your dog is protected, make sure that their vaccinations are given, that the vaccinations are up to date. And you also want to make sure that uh, your dog and other dogs coming into contact with them, uh, their behavior are okay, they are not likely to be aggressive. And other than socializing with other dogs, it's also very important to socialize your dog with other people and other environments as well. So it's good, starting from a young age, to get your dog used to different people, different visitors, different guests in your home. 
it's also good to get them familiar with other environments such as your home, your car, if you're taking them out to the park or vet clinic. Also good to get them familiar with the vet clinic and just get them used to many different things when they're young so that they will likely be okay when they're older. Okay, thank you. Chiwan, for your questions. Uh, next question will be on for maybe young, young age Wong. Yes? Okay. So, young age Wong asks, do we have to trim the fur around the paw pads? Okay, Miss. So Wong or Miss Wong, I think this is a good question whether you have to trim the fur around the paw pads. So I'm trying to think of some reasons why you are, might be thinking of doing this. So I think if the fur around the paw pads get too long, that can actually reduce the friction and then your dog may have difficulty walking on the ground. Or even sometimes when the fur is long, then you might notice that your dog is chewing and licking at the paws. So uh, if your dog has long fur, it's always a good idea to keep the fur trim and uh, you can take them to the groomers or you can do it yourself but because you'll be using a scissors to be very careful around the paw pads because if you accidentally cut the paw pad, there can actually be quite a lot of bleeding. So when it happens, just apply pressure and then the bleeding should stop and then the paw pad should heal. But it's definitely a good idea to keep your pet's fur trimmed regularly. So Susan asks, is it okay to only walk on top? Yes. So Susan asks, is it okay to only walk a dog during evenings because school is still on? So what do you think about that, Dr. Alvin? Okay. So Susan, I think from this question, you're trying to say you're a student, so you can only walk your pet after you're home from school. So uh, it doesn't really matter what time of the day you walk your pet, but uh, you do take note. Uh, uh, if you are going to walk your pet in hot sun, then uh, you need to make sure that they have enough water, you don't walk them too long or they might overheat. So the evening is a good time to walk your pet and the important thing is actually to be consistent. So if you are going to walk your pet in the evening, then do commit to walking your pet in the evening regularly. Uh, if you can, you can even throw in another walk in another part of the day and keep the walk short. So I mean, there's no harm walking in the evening, it's definitely a good idea as long as you give your pet exercise. Okay, thank you Dr. Alvin. So let's, let's choose uh, Wei Yuan, Alvin's host question. Okay, this one, the one below? Yeah, uh, on top there. Uh, just one right uh, that way, uh, uh, below that. Yes, uh, yes, this one. Well, Alvin asks, what are the care regimes regimes for a senior dog. Okay, thanks Elvin. So when we are talking about senior dogs, I think I can go on about a whole another hour of what you can do for senior dogs. So as your dog age, you need to be aware of some of the changes that will take place in your dog. So for example, their metabolic rate may decrease and so whatever you used to have been feeding them, the amount of feed you give them uh, might be too much because activity decrease but you still give them the same calories. So monitor their weight, monitor their body condition. You might need to alter the amount of feed you're giving. You might even want to consider giving a senior diet. So uh, diet for senior dogs generally contain less calories and they may also contain more omega-3 fatty acids which is good uh, for the joints and to reduce inflammation in dogs. Uh, some other things you need to take note of is on the health care of a senior dog. So uh, just like us, when we grow old, we get more prone to diseases. Same in dogs, when they are old, they become also more prone to diseases. So you need to, be, you need to keep monitoring your pet, uh, monitor their behaviour, monitor their appetite, the amount of water they are drinking, whether they are able to pee and poo okay. And if you notice there's any abnormalities, if they are straining to pee or if they are peeing more than normal, drinking more water than normal, that could be signs that there's an underlying condition and that's when you should take your dog to the vet for a further checkup. Ah, okay, so let's choose... Okay, the one on top, Kim Chua's question. 
So King Chuas Kim asked, My 11 year old dog has been barking around 9 pm every night recently. Is this a sign of aging? Okay, thank you, Kim. So, the reason for dogs barking, uh, there can be many, many different reasons actually. So, uh, dogs, they are not able to talk like us, so how they communicate is through barking, that's natural. But it's very important to find out the reason why they are barking. So, for example, uh, if you notice that they are barking at night, uh, is it because there's uh, any there's any activities going out there? Are they barking at anyone? Or are they barking at you trying to get your attention? So, uh, at 11 year old, your dog is actually at quite a good age. So, if any time you think that uh, it's some underlying health condition, it's always good to bring your dog to the vet for a full health check and then they can uh, help, to, help to determine whether or not your dog has any underlying conditions. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alwyn, for that. Uh, thank you, Kim, for your question. Okay, let's take one from the one there, from Jose Maria Louis Montes Claras. He asked, so Louis asked, a question on pet is all right to is it all right to approach owners to pet their pets? And what is the best way to do this? Uh, any do's and don'ts? And yeah. Okay, thank you, Jose, for your question on pet etiquette or pet etiquette. Now I know what it means. So uh, of course, the first thing you want to do if you want to touch another person's pet is to ask them for permission. You can also ask them whether or not their pets are okay to be touched by strangers. Uh, so of course, the, the owner might tell you, yes, it's okay, or maybe try not to because their pet might be aggressive. But of course, even if the owner tells you that it's okay, don't fully trust them because pets can be unpredictable. They might be okay with certain people, they might not be okay with certain people, and you don't know when they might, uh, when they might uh, try to nip at you because that's how they defend themselves. So if you're going to touch a pet for the first time, do approach the pet slowly and you can bend down to be less scary to the pet and just uh, stick out your hand lightly and let the pet approach you. So if the pet is okay, they will start to approach you, they'll sniff you, they might lick you and that's when you know you can probably proceed further to pet the animal. Thank you, Jose Maria Louis Montes Claras for that very interesting question because it is something I've always wanted to know as well. So Dr. Elwin, thank you for enlightening us about it. So now let's go through one question. What else is there that is really interesting? Okay. So I saw one from Ryan just now. Should we try to answer that? That one was really great. Let me try to find that question. Uh, yes, so this is the one. Yes, okay. found it. So we have a question from Ryan. Is so, it safe to vaccinate mm -hmm. my pet? And are there any side effects? So of course, I think now with the whole COVID vaccination issue, I think everyone's very familiar yeah. with the pros and cons of vaccination. So vaccines, just like any other medication, uh, they have been evaluated to be safe to use and they are effective. So vaccines can actually save lives they can protect our pets from uh, common infectious diseases. So in dogs, it could be things like parvovirus, distemper, in cat, it could be things like panleukopenia. And these are diseases that are commonly found in the environment, and so our animals are susceptible, susceptible to them. There's no treatment, and it's very difficult to treat such diseases. So the benefits of vaccination is definitely worth it. Of course, with all vaccination, there's always a small proportion of animals that may have adverse reactions. So this can range something from a swelling at the injection site to even some kind of more systemic allergic reaction. So it's always a good practice after vaccination to monitor your pet so that if there's any intervention or any uh, first aid required, it can be provided in a timely manner. So I would also like to take this chance to talk a bit more about the Singapore vaccination guidelines that were published recently. So the Singapore Vaccination Guidelines for Pets was uh, developed by the Animal and Veterinary Service together with the Singapore Veterinary Association. So this document is available on our website. It talks about the, the reasons why pets should be vaccinated, the pros and cons. It also gives you recommendations on what diseases you should vac vaccinate your pet against. 
and what are some of the diseases where you may or may not need the vaccine depending on your circumstances. So do have a look at these vaccination guidelines on our website and also discuss with your attending veterinarian on a suitable vaccination schedule for your pets. Thank you, Ryan, for your question. Okay, we can take in one last question. So let's take one from Tiang. So Tiang asks for Dr. Elwin to do an overview on neutering. So Dr. Elwin, what do you think about neutering in Singapore? So here is his question. So there are a few questions and on pet neutering. So please do answer them so that pet owners have a good idea of when to neuter their pets. Okay, Yang, so thank you for helping to summarize all the multiple questions on neutering for us. So uh, neutering is quite an important procedure in pets and there are many benefits uh, that neutering can bring about. So I think the most important one is to prevent unwanted breeding. So with all pets, when they reach sexual maturity, they can reproduce and if you're not prepared to have litters, they might accidentally mate and produce litters. And that's where you get unwanted uh, animals and you have to find a way to rehome all of them. Uh, there are certain other benefits on the health of your animals for neutering as well and the behaviour as well. So for example, for male dogs, uh, if you neuter them, that may resolve certain behaviour issues such as um, spraying or even aggression. In female dogs, uh, neutering is known to reduce the risk of uh, memory tumours and if you do it after a certain age then that benefit is no longer there. So uh, definitely we will recommend for pet owners to neuter their pets so that uh, that will prevent any unnecessary breeding that will also bring about certain health benefits for your pet. If you need more information you can always discuss this with your attending vet you can talk more about the pros and cons of neutering. You can, can also find out when is the best age to neuter your pet. Okay, so thank you Dr. Alwyn for that question, for answering that question. Okay, so once again, thank you all for joining us. So if you found this webinar useful, please click on the like button and also share this video with your family and friends. So keep a look out for our AVS website or Animal Buzz SG Facebook for future free webinars. We look forward to seeing you again and goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you.